to give the talk today. Um, and what I'll do is I'll try to, to uh, speak for about 40 minutes, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll have questions after that. Um, I believe very strongly in uh, interactivity, especially in the fact that we're in the same room together. If you have a question or you want to um, you want to clarify something, then please uh, signal and I don't mind stopping a bit flow. Similarly, um, if I speak to, because I get very excited about rubbish, um, <laughs> if, if I speak too quickly uh, in my excitement, then slow me down. So, basically what we're dealing with here, and this is a, a cover of New Yorker magazine from 2007 when I started working on this project in earnest, uh, which was funded by the Economic and Social, History Re or Economic and Social Research Council. Um, and this struck me as a, a nice image to begin with about different types of bins, um, in this case, uh, in some sort of uh, island in the Pacific. Um, this is the outline of what I'll be talking about today. Um, First of all, talking about the issue at stake, uh, looking at um, the context for the talk, and basically that's putting this uh, talk in the context of the book that uh, Klaus mentioned. Um, we'll then talk about how everything started in 1945, about materials, systems, and context, uh, and then the drivers for change in both cases. And there we'll be looking at similarities and differences between the UK and Germany, and then looking at, in more detail at the response in both countries as concluding with some uh, explanation of the differences. Now, the issue at stake here is uh, this one. How do we explain differences uh, between the UK and Germany in the development of bin design between 1945 and the 1970s, given that there were many, uh, the, the, the many of the factors uh, that affect bin design were the same in both countries? Uh, and we would expect, therefore, given the common drivers, which I'll be talking about, that there would be a similar outcome, and there, there is a big diverge. And here's what I mean uh, graphically. There's the British dustbin in 1945, and the same, the British dustbin in 1975. I'm not sure which is which, actually, I can't remember, <laughs> but I think you agree with me that there's a lot of similarities in the, the design. And I will be pointing out some of the uh, issues involved in, in bin design uh, a little bit, depending on how much uh, time I have. But here I just note that these are made out of galvanized steel. Um, they are uh, fluted. That is, the, uh, the galvanized steel is, is, is done in this way. Uh, and they have a lid on the top, two handles at the side. And the reason for that, of course, is so that a man or two men, and it was almost always men, could lift those and dump them into a vehicle uh, for collection. In contrast, here is a typical West German bin in 1945. And these are the bins that I'll be talking about that emerged by 1975 in large numbers. Now all of, and we are talking about a gradual, because these cost money, um, they, they have staying power. They tend to, these tend to stay around for a while because they cost a lot to replace them. There's a re replacement cycle. But essentially what we have is, I would point out two different things. First of all, two different kinds of bins, one of which is a 220 liter uh, plastic bin and plastic with wheels. Um, and then this is a, a, a 1.1 cubic meter bin, which is very typical uh, in all the European countries, including the UK now, um, but was already fairly commonplace in Germany in 1975. Now these are East German dust bins in 1945. In 1975, and I won't be talking about East German. I can talk a little bit about it because of having uh, written some, some about East German technology as well. But um, this is an indication that things didn't change very much in the East. So, how do we explain the differences? Um, and uh, first of all, before I get into that in detail, I want to explain the context of, of this. Um, the first aspect of the con context has to do with the general context in business history and history of technology, which are my two main fields. And what I became interested in, uh, especially in the um, 19, uh, really part of the uh, mid middle of the 1990s, um, and especially in the last few years, is looking at business history beyond the firm and thinking about business history uh, in and, and technological history in terms of the exploration of organizational forms, rhetoric, or, or practice, uh, 
which is drawn from business, and here I was especially uh, uh, affected by the discourse in universities uh, about business plans and so on, which struck me as having nothing to do with business, but nonetheless, it is interesting to look at. Um, the study of business and technology in context, that is the social and political environment within which uh, business operates and technology is developed. Uh, again, this uh, links to interests that I've had for a long time in science and technology studies. Uh, and more importantly, the issue of business, technology, and the natural environment, the physical environment, uh, and trying to get at these kind of issues uh, at the same time. It struck me that this kind of a project on the history of um, waste management, the emergence of waste management, would be, um, would be there's a couple of seats here. Um, it struck me that this would allow me to think about these kind of issues uh, in a broader context. Now, the more specific context for why I chose uh, uh, cleansing and waste management as a main focus uh, had to do with my age and background, the growing awareness in the 1960s and 70s uh, of the, uh, the environment, uh, especially with small is beautiful, the limits of growth, and the public, I should say, the public of Rome. Um, and from the 1980s onwards, the uh, issue of climate change, I became very interested in environmental issues. And there was uh, recycling in particular caught my imagination uh, in the context of living uh, and working in upstate New York in the early 1990s, late 80s, and early 90s. Uh, I lived in Berlin, actually in 1989 and 1994, five, before moving to Glasgow in 1995, where I've been since. And in that particular time, New York State had started to recycle uh, on, a, on a very systematic basis. Berlin was very advanced. Glasgow had a recycling rate of 4% when I moved there. And I was thinking, why is it that countries and areas could be so different from one another? Uh, and that's the motivation for this. Um, and so I began to develop a comparative project initially uh, comparing the US, the UK, and Germany. It became too complicated. There's a lot written on the US. It's very different from the UK and Germany, which are different from each other. But uh, they're similar enough that we decided we could do something. So we moved beyond recycling, which was the original idea, uh, into the, uh, uh, the issue of the emergence of waste management. And I think this is an important thing that we've done in, in the research that we've been working on, uh, is to emphasize uh, the importance of vocabulary uh, and terminology and rhetoric uh, as being very, waste management is a concept that is relatively recent. And it was called public cleansing before, and there was a, there, and it was called the same thing in German essentially, uh, in uh, through the 1970s. And there's a very real difference between public cleansing, which is a health management <coughs> primarily, uh, and waste management, which is an economic business. Uh, set of vocabulary. And similarly, there are um, differences between salvage, which was early recycling, and recycling, because the motivations and the outcomes are completely different from one another. Uh, we generated a uh, project uh, proposal which was accepted by the ESRC and, and awarded in August, with the effect of, from August 2007. Uh, I promised the monograph in 2011. It was delivered on time in 2013. Uh, <laughs> uh, there, there was a bit of a delay there. Uh, this is the physical artifact, uh, which actually is fairly substantial, but um, Klaus asked me if I would bring along, some, or if I had brought along some copies to sign, sign and sell. Well, I'd be happy to sign them, but selling them, unless you have a very deep pocketbook, it would probably be uh, 65 pounds uh, deal in it. Steal it at any price. Right? <laughs> but so I only brought the one. I didn't think I'd sell a whole lot of copies. But libraries, you good libraries, you will have, have it now. And this was published in November. Uh, and it compares, uh, there's a scene from Britain in Leicester Square in uh, the late, late 1970s and uh, in Germany in the late 1970s, uh, indicating the importance, the political, social, economic, and business importance of waste management. But this talk, in particular, is about one aspect of that, and that is about the issue of bins, and why are these bins <coughs> so different from one another. Now, I'm going to show you a table from the, uh, the book, which um, indicates some of the design parameters for 
uh, bin design. Um, I'm not going to read them through, but I just want to, sh and, and they'll be too small to actually read. Um, but essentially, what there are a number of things that make a difference uh, in terms of deciding what, how to build a bin. Uh, one of them has to do with size, which is determined by a number of other factors, which I'll not go into. Uh, weight, durability, shape, fit with collection vehicle. Uh, in, in, in this case, um, that's, uh, that's one of the complications that we'll be looking into with regard to Germany in particular. Fit with other aspects of the urban environment and safety. And what we'll, what we'll see, and I, and I think I won't be taking too much away from the conclusions as we go along, is that the issue of durability and safety was the mo those two were the most important in the case of Germany. Um, that other factors affected the design in Germany. Sorry, those were the important things in, in both Germany and the UK in 1945. They remained the most important considerations for Britain for a variety of reasons after 1945 and into the 70s. Whereas in Germany, other aspects became more important, which tended to change the way that it was. Uh, they were designed. Now, let me just go back here to talk about the design in 1945 and materials, uh, systems, and contents. In 1945, what was typical here was that these were items which were the product of uh, industrialized, first, first and early, second industrial revolution uh, technologies that were made out of steel. Um, they, uh, or, or, or some sort of steel alloy. Um, secondly, they were made, the reason they were made out of steel and metal was for two reasons primarily. The first had to do with uh, the, uh, the kind of material that was likely to go into the thing. And it was mostly, most of the weight of this container, or what was inside the container uh, in 1945, would have been ash and cinder from coal, coal fires. And so part of the reason that they're designed in this way is so they don't catch fire. Uh, so that's one reason. The second thing is they're fitted with a, a, a lid. Uh, the lid is to contain uh, the putrefying matter for food waste in particular uh, that was, would go into the, these bins as well. So they're to contain disease uh, as well as to contain other things. Um, the other aspect of it is that they have handles on both sides. Uh, this is a bigger bin than usual, would have been usual in Germany. I can find a picture um, of an earlier one that was uh, easily available. But both of them have handles on each side. Uh, and that would have been, in a British case, a man would have lifted it up and dumped it into uh, a, a refuse vehicle. In this case, two people would have been needed for it because it's that much uh, heavier. Um, Now, the other thing I'll note, note about both of these is that Germany had already in the 1920s, and I'll come back to this shortly, uh, experimented, uh, many German cities had experimented with, uh, with what was called dustless loading. That is, the connection of a garbage can to a vehicle, and mechanically connecting those two things to one another, which is fairly typical nowadays. Um, so there was a tradition, uh, the vast majority of German rubbish was handled in the same way as the British ones uh, were at that time. Okay, so the drivers have changed, and I do here want to emphasize some differences between uh, the two countries uh, in terms of uh, uh, development. Um, the first thing uh, is that the pre-war levels of development in the two countries were relatively different from one another in the sense that British were on average wealthier than the Germans. Um, and this is perhaps surprising from a contemporary sense, but, it, and I'll come back to it again shortly, it shows it showing GDP changes over time. But essentially, that is uh, one aspect of um, the differences between them. There's a different starting point. And that had an effect in, in two ways. First of all, British rubbish was more uniform than German rubbish, because it was a much more integrated national market. So it tended to be that the rubbish in Bavaria would have been different from that in North Rhine-Westphalia or in Berlin. In, in Germany, they became more similar over time. 
In Britain, because of the national market and the very early development of, of the uniform uh, market, it would have been much more, uh, they would have been much more si similar to one another. The second thing, again, has to do with levels of wealth. Collection of rubbish in municipalities in Britain was universal. That is, anything within a municipal limits generally, well, there was no absolute requirement that cities had to collect rubbish. It was a recommendation by Parliament until surprisingly recently. Uh, but um, they all did it. Uh, and in German cities, in contrast, only the very center of the city was, uh, was, uh, had a, 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 a regular service. Everything else was dealt with uh, privately or by the individuals themselves. Um, so that's the extent of the collection service in the pre-war period. Uh, the effects of the war were different from one another. Certainly there was a running down of equipment in, in Britain. There was some damage as a result of bombing. But by and large, the British service survived intact. The German one was heavily destroyed, especially in certain areas. Dortmund, for instance, uh, virtually the entire fleet of vehicles was destroyed. Many of the bids were destroyed uh, as well, which has an impact. Another factor that is different is, the, is related to this level of destruction, that is the um, the reconstruction after the war. And what happens then after the war is that city planners who have developed uh, a whole range of ideas about how to plan cities effectively were given the opportunity to do that because of the, by virtue of the destruction in Germany. Um, that wasn't so much the case uh, in Britain. Another difference uh, is, especially uh, not so much in Scotland, but certainly in, in the vast majority of the UK, uh, houses tend to be more typical than flats, and that has an impact on the choice of bins and the design of bins as well. The f final uh, point here uh, is, has to do with the materiality of the waste stream. Um, the transition to central heating is one of the things that's very important in terms of dis determining the change in the, the materials that go into the garbage can. Um, and in Britain, the transition to central heating was slower than in Germany, in part, in part because of this reconstruction issue. Um, and that meant that in Britain, ash and cinder continued, continued to be a much larger proportion of the waste, waste stream over time. Um, there also, this also means when you go to central heating, you lose the facility to burn paper. And so therefore, paper becomes much more important in the waste stream. Uh, over, over time. And then finally, and, and I'll show you some figures on this, the uptake of plastics is different. Ger the Germans, by and large, used plastic much more than did the British, uh, and they took, took up uh, plastics much more uh, quickly and, and, and heavily. And one of the, um, the, uh, the, one of the things that the two, these two things together entail is that the waste stream became lighter on average but it also became more voluminous. That is, it was more stuff. And you know, plastics is one of the key things there. Now, I mentioned this before, I'll just uh, talk about it a little bit again, is the difference between the UK and Germany in terms of what's called dustless loading uh, and the system that was developed uh, in Germany in the 1920s by Schmidt and Melmark for the SM system, uh, which was typical in a fair number of cities in Germany, certainly not universal, though, um, at, at all. I just want to point out a couple of things here. First of all, we see here, this is a much more typical bin than the one I showed you earlier uh, in 1945 in, 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 in Germany. Uh, but, and this one wasn't for dustless loading. Uh, but it has certain design features which are a little bit different from the other ones that I was talking about. First of all, it has two handles here as well as on the other side so that you could either lift that way or lift that way. So it could be either one person or two people. It has a hinge on the back, which means that if you grasp the ones in the back, you can lift it into a vehicle and it will dump itself. Uh, or it will, it will, you don't have to take the lid off uh, for each one. Now these, in the case these are the Schmidt and Melmer um, uh, ones, and this is from 1928, for instance, and this is, indicates the variety that even Schmidt and Melmer were, were, doing, were, were uh, putting together at that time. But these ones are meant to be hooked up to a vehicle directly. 
So the vehicle uh, picks up the hooks here, and then there's a mechanism that allows for the lid to be open and for the things to be dumped into the, the vehicle. So that sort of thing uh, had, was existed in Germany before 1945. In Britain, it was dreamed about by, and believe me, these <laughs> practitioners talk about their dreams of how to have the ideal garbage system. Uh, and there are some, some really those wacky ideas in, 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 uh, along the way. But they were able to implement it in Germany uh, in this one case uh, in, in about four or five cities um, that is built upon, that this tradition is built upon uh, in the later, uh, later years. Okay, so those are differences between the UK and Germany, and I'll be coming back to it. Some of those differences help to explain the differences in design, uh, but uh, there are also a lot of similarities. I want to spend time on those first. Now, one of the reasons that we decided not to include, incorporate the US into our research was that it is that the US is, first of all, much larger geographically, has a much larger population than either of the other two countries, and it's much more dispersed, so that the population density is much, uh, much smaller. Um, in the UK and <coughs> Germany, in contrast, there are many more similarities along all of these lines. And the idea was to try to hold as many things constant as possible. However, I do point out that the average, uh, the GDP per capita in, uh, in and these are in thousands of international gear, your commerce dollars, which is a way of, of norming things over time, um, that, that Britain's uh, per capita GDP was considerably higher than that of Germany in 1950. Uh, nonetheless, wealth was not equally distributed in Britain, and therefore levels of consumer consumerism were relatively low in both countries. So both were in some ways societies of want rather than societies of plenty. They became societies of plenty over time, and we noticed that the the Germans are catching up in terms of GDP per capita. About 1970, the two uh, lines cross, and the Germans become, on average, more wealthy uh, than the British. So I've got a number of slides on, on these same points. So there's a second slide here about becoming a uh, consumer society. And this is the uptake of consumer du durables in Britain between 1950 and 1978. We don't have data like this for Germany. Um, so uh, we, we, what we did was to, to uh, take the data and plot, plot them, indicating that a larger and larger percentage of households are getting uh, televisions, clothes washing machines, uh, and refrigerators. Uh, this is where we start. <coughs> this is another indication of the society of want rather than plenty. Uh, and this is an indication of consumer society. Now, we're not talking about consumer durables. They tend not to end up in the garbage can. They tend to end, end up being disposed of otherwise, in other ways. But they are indications of this uptake of the consumer society. For instance, the growing presence of televisions uh, meant that there was likely to be a growing presence of refrigerators because people tend to stay in and have, and especially in Germany, this, this is the case where uh, the rise of bottled beer uh, sales, the rise of refrigerator sales, and the rise of television sales are closely correlated to one another. This integrated consumption is important. These are indicators of that kind of thing. Um, but the, the thing that most people who look at, there's a lot of historians who look at consumerism, a lot who look at production, and what they tend not to look at is what's thrown away as a result of that. And that's part of what we're trying to do. So, chain materiality of waste stream, and this is a little bit hard to, to uh, read, but these, this is the number of, the amount of um, plastic per capita uh, consumed in various countries, US, uh, Britain, West Germany, and Japan. Uh, and for Britain, we have uh, this line here. And for West Germany, we have this line here. And you see that by 1969, the Germans are consuming nearly twice as, or over twice as much plastic per capita uh, compared to Britain, which is a really dramatic development. And one of the, uh, both of them are moving in the direction of more and more plastics. 
But again, this is a slight difference between uh, the, the two. The two. Um, there's also a change in the materiality. I've already mentioned that uh, the paper and cardboard tends not to be burned anymore uh, because of central heating. Uh, there's also the role of le legislation in all of this. And there's similar legislation in Germany. The UK Clean Air Act of 1956 foresaw a gradual replace or a gradual outlawing of coal fires, uh, and that meant, uh, as a result, more uptake of uh, central heating. Um, and again, I underscore that this means uh, lighter rubbish in each garbage can, um, but also more voluminous. You need more garbage cans or more space in the garbage cans. The final thing that I want to emphasize is that practitioners in both countries advocated rationalization. They advocated changing the way that things were done, not doing things the way that they had been in the past. Uh, and this uh, was pursued in a variety of different ways. It was pursued in uh, arguments and, and, and uh, cajoling of the city councils who paid the bills. Um, in both cases, uh, there were plans developed, for instance, in Birmingham for, uh, for, for a dustless loading system to be rolled out. There were various other things that happened both Practitioners in the UK and in Germany thought about different materials for the construction of bins uh, uh, over time. And they, they uh, talked about these things in a variety of conferences, in a variety of journals as well. And that's the kind of material that we've looked at to try to get at these, uh, these discussions. Okay, um, what I want to do now is to look at the uh, response uh, in the UK to these drivers for change. And there were already in, 19, in the mid-1940s discussions about how best to deal with the fact that rubbish uh, is becoming different. There were people who foresaw that rubbish would become different over time. That became more pressing as time went on. And by the 19, early, early 1950s, there was a crisis in Britain and in Germany about where, where uh, about the change of the waste stream and the effect that it's having on the traditional ways of disposal, which were burning or, or, or burying. Those were the two things that were, were, were done and continue to be very important in, in the, the whole process. I should mention here that, that, that one of the uh, things that we, we, we uh, just, one of the oddities that we came up with and one of the things that reinforced our, our sense that this was not a sort of that there was not a foregone conclusion that Germany would be different and perhaps more, um, more environmentally sensible uh, in various ways than Britain. Uh, just, just to emphasize that in the, through the, the mid-1960s, uh, Germans, as a reaction to what had happened during the war, uh, by and large threw everything into landfill. Uh, it was only when the landfills started to fill up and became not just landfills, but mountains. Um, that they started thinking about different things or a number of other factors as well. In Britain, in contrast, especially in Glasgow, which I mentioned as having only a 4% recycling rate in 1995, in uh, 1950, uh, 1965, uh, Glasgow was one of the poster children for, uh, for what we would now call recycling uh, and, uh, and reuse. Uh, they actually recycled almost everything that came in, in terms of metal, paper, glass, uh, and they buried only the inert material, which was uh, cinder and ash. Uh, there was also re recovery of foodstuffs, and they used a lot of it for incineration. The incineration, in turn, drove an electrical uh, facility, which powered or, or charged up electrically powered vehicles for use in the dump sites. So we have a real contrast here. In Frankfurt, there was a problem with what they call Monte Chardolino, which was the uh, uh, mountain of shards that it, it was the result of dumping and then over dumping, so that it became a mountain. Uh, whereas in, in Glasgow, they were uh, had a, basically an early version of zero waste. Um, the two countries diverged from one another at that time. That's part of what we'll be talking about here with regard to bins in particular. In any case, the Ministry of Housing and Local Government appointed a working party in the 1960s. Uh, 
and who reported in 1967 on their findings. And they have interviewed a number of people uh, and a number of organizations. They had uh, thought about various issues. And what I just want to point out here that there was uh, evidence given to the committee that things had to change, that the, the common galvanized iron and steel bin was simply not fit for purpose. The Association of Public Health Inspectors said, for instance, that such bins could no longer be regarded as a hygienic means of refuse, ref, refuse storage. The Association of Rural District Surveyors said that such bins are relatively cheap, but also insanitary, noisy, heavy, and unsightly. They advocated both of these organizations. Plastic bins, which were lighter, quieter to, hand, uh, quieter to handle, and easier to keep clean. The Working Party rejected those findings. They said, it's necessary to assume that current, current patterns of use will continue for some years at any rate. And part of this has to do with the context, of the economic context of Britain, where um, there's pressure on the local authorities. They don't have a lot of money to invest. And so the thought of replacing all of these things uh, at the same time, or even in, uh, over time, is something that they um, they, they could, not, uh, could, could not face. But the Working Party also rejected the claim that galvanized bins were unsanitary. Uh, and there's, there's some, some uh, of the, um, well, I'll come back to that shortly. The, they also pointed out that plastic bins vary in quality, uh, vary in quality. Uh, there were no industrial standards. They were liable to damage if hot ash was introduced. And again, the, per, the persistence of coal-fired fired, uh, systems, uh, heating systems in, in, in non-central heating systems in, in Britain is important there. Because if hot ash is introduced into a, a, a plastic container, obviously there's going to be some damage. So they recommended that steel bins produced according to the British Industrial Standard in 1947, as amended in 1965, should remain the most common type. Um, essentially, the emphasis is on two design criteria. First of all, durability. Experience has shown that traditional steel bins give long service. Okay, so they're relatively cheap. They're, uh, they don't have to be replaced very often. But the second thing is safety. They have a proven track record for containing nuisance. That was what, what they call it. And they were fireproof including uh, reducing the danger of accidental bin fires, which were caused by householders who deliberately fired the, this is fur, I should say, deliberately fired the contents of the bin in order to cleanse them of put putrefying matter. And th this was a big problem, apparently, people setting their bins on fire to clean them. Um, and, and of course, you don't want to have a plastic bin uh, in, in that case. So the privileging here is of two of the design parameters that I talked about earlier and that chart I'll come back to again. But essentially, there's continuity by virtue of the fact that they're emphasizing durability and safety to the exclusion of everything else. And notice that they're not talking about dustless loading. They're not talking about, uh, they're talking a little bit about plastic, but not really seriously. And they're basically talking about things staying uh, the same. Now, what happened to Germany? Here we have a uh, uh, major difference. Uh, and I think that the, the so-called uh, economic miracle in Germany uh, it goes to a large part of this. Uh, essentially, what you have in Germany is a, a correlated to this rise in G, sharp rise in GDP and the catch up with Britain uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, that where Germany overtakes in about 1970 in terms of per capita GDP, is a sharp rise in living standards and a sharp rise in consumerism. And again, the reaction to the war is important. So people wanted things, they wanted more things, and they didn't want to be bothered recycling those things uh, if, or salvaging those. Again, the reaction to wartime salvage operations was noticeable. And there is a direct contrast with Britain, which maintained wartime uh, salvage operations for a much longer period of time. Uh, so they weren't discredited the way they were in, in Germany. Again, the post-war reconstruction of German cities is important with the emphasis on flats rather than individual houses, the rapid adoption of central heating systems, and then the declining unemployment as a result of 
this economic miracle, by the early 1960s, you have virtually zero employment, unemployment rate in Germany. It's about 1%, but under 1% for much of the decade. And it's really not until the 1970s when German unemployment rates go up into uh, 5 and then 10% uh, for, for a persistent amount of time. Now, one of the things that is a result of that is that waste collection, which is one of the worst jobs in the world, uh, is something that people are trying to avoid. Uh, in contrast, uh, the unemployment rate, although the unemployment rate was fairly uh, low in Britain as well during this period, it was much higher, and it was a, although there was a lot of turnover, it wasn't difficult to find people who would actually uh, do the work. Now, as a result of all of these things, I, this is one of the reasons why practitioners in Germany embraced radical change uh, rather than thinking we can continue as is. Uh, but they did that in a series of steps, and I won't go into the, the, the great detail about this, but I think that uh, it's important to recognize that they don't leap immediately to the kind of uh, bins that I showed you uh, at the beginning. Um, essentially, the first thing they did was to replace, and this is, doesn't apply everywhere, but to many cities, they replaced small individual bins with larger ones. This, though, made things worse. Well, the German bins were, as we might expect, heavier than British ones to begin with. Uh, when you double the size of that, uh, or increase the size of that substantially, then you're talking about something that a person can't lift anymore. British bins could be lifted by one person, uh, even when they were full. German bins were difficult to do so when they were full, when they were small. When they were larger, they became impossible. So the result of that, or to deal with that problem, <laughs> They um, decided to make them even bigger, but to link them up to the dustless loading tradition of the SM, uh, schmidt and system, uh, to handle them mechanically, so that you would have a linkage between the two. The two. And again, this was the typical uh, size of a bin in Germany uh, in, uh, in 1945 and as late as the uh, early 1960s, and this size is more typical than by the 1960s. And actually, this is the bin that emerges uh, as the, the bin, uh, the, the, the most common type of bin. Um, but before I get to that, um, they experimented with very large bins, four cubic meters in some cities. Um, these, were, uh, these would allow longer collection cycles, so you wouldn't have to go around and pick up the garbage quite as often, which would save on labor. They were mechanical as well. But there was a real problem uh, because of so-called user abuse. And that's what they, they called it. The user abuse consisted of several things. First of all, trade uh, waste was discovered in the, uh, in the bins. So people were from uh, companies and stores were going by and dumping their stuff in. Secondly, four cubic meter bins can hold things like couches that people want to throw away. So there's a big, big problem that you're ending up with a very full bin uh, because, of, because of this. And the final thing was uh, there were reports of teenagers uh, hanging out of these bins and setting them on fire, uh, and uh, even in Germany. And so that, that, that sort of thing was uh, one of the reasons they were withdrawn. So the city of Wiesbaden, which is a, a small, a smallish city near Frankfurt, uh, collaborated with bin manufacturers uh, in, beginning in 1960 to develop a common standard for the size of the bin. Uh, and the size and design of that bin were very standard eventually uh, throughout the, um, the, 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 uh, the country. Uh, and I'll talk about why they became common throughout the country a little bit later. Um, but I just want to notice, note a couple of things about this. First of all, this is a 1.1 liter bin which became standard in Wiesbaden. This does not have wheels on it. Uh, it is still a flat bin that, that, that is lifted uh, from uh, where it sits. Um, it is, however, designed so that it will, uh, can be a, a linked up to a, a dustless collection vehicle uh, as well. Um, the 1.1 uh, 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 cubic, uh, uh, sorry, 
1.1, 110 liter uh, uh, garbage can became a standard. They also developed this with manufacturers, which is a, a 1.1 cubic liter uh, container, um, which rapidly spread throughout Germany, although, of course, it wasn't used everywhere. Uh, and this indicates that 10 of these could be replaced by one of those. This has, although you can't see it, also has wheels on it, which allows for the, uh, the bin to be moved around with a relatively small number of people. Um, so this is large enough to hold a week's refuse, refuse, even though everything is going at that point into the landfill, as we talked about. From a group of, of, of flats that deterred dumping from non-residents, and also was hard to, to set on fire. You couldn't put a couch in it, it was too small for that. So it was good in that way. It was robust, but it was easy to handle for the two-man crew. And this, the, these bins uh, became uh, then ubiqu ubiquitous, and a German industrial norm uh, was, uh, was developed for that. Now, here we have two pictures from, um, this one's from, from later. Fortunately, you can't see the, uh, the individual pictures here because the, the slide is actually reversed. Um, but I didn't have time to, to put it back around because it shows you the, the, the general idea. A couple of things I would, would emphasize here. First of all, these bins are still the 1.1 or 110 liter bins. However, they're attached via a, a dustless loading system. So there is a transition period, which we'll, I'll come back to in the next slide. This is the 1.1 cubic meter bin attached to the, uh, the vehicle as well, and two guys who, uh, who operate that. Now, the other thing I emphasize here is that this, these are different, it's not only because that's far away, it's also small, um, smaller than this one, uh, and those, those the, the continuity and use of different kinds of bins was, uh, was there in Germany as well. The bins are still made out of metal. changing material of the bins sharp. Now, what we have here is a, an indication of the adoption of bins in Mannheim between, uh, I shouldn't say 1057, I should say, uh, I should say, I, I mistyped that. I should say 1957 to 1985. I'm not sure where I came up with that. In any case, um, what this shows, this is just the, the number of bins, so it doesn't, it's not normal for capacity. Um, but it shows that the number of bins in these, in Mannheim was 40,000 uh, 110 liter bins in 1957, uh, which rises uh, until 1971 and then drops very precipitously. This is the number of 1.1 uh, cubic meter bins which come online, beginning in the early 60s. And here we see actually a fairly rapid diffusion of that standard that was developed in Wiesbaden to places like Mannheim. Uh, and e remember that each of these bins holds 10 times as much as one of these bins, 110. And what we have here, and, and I think that that's just because it was zeros until 1972, 71, 72, is the rise of the 2.2, uh, 220 uh, liter bin, which was a plastic bin. Uh, and that really is uh, where the transition takes place. Uh, the plastic bins also, they're larger, they can hold more, but they also can, uh, uh, can be attached to, uh, to uh, vehicles. They, because they're wheeled, they can be held by one person rather than more than one. Now, the other, again, plastic is one of the as aspects of this, wheels are the other, and eventually colors are introduced as well. And I do have, and this is one of the great um, uh, perks of my, my project, was getting a, uh, a wheelie bin, a bin on my own that I can carry around with me. Um, I don't do it normally, but I, I, I brought it today. Um, again, this happens to be, this is this Clico, um, which is a Kramer, uh, which is a, uh, a, a bin uh, company in England that produces under a German license. It's basically it's a German bin. Um, 
and it just there, there are various types of these, and you can see that there are slight differences. And this one locks, and that one, these ones have different uh, mechanisms for attaching to it. But essentially, what these all do is that there is some sort of way of linking to the vehicle. Uh, they're lifted by the vehicle under here. The vehicle also has a it, it inserts here, and they lift and, and, and do that. So the human beings don't have to deal with that. So I'm going to conclude in about five minutes here. Um, and the, 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 this is not a, a, um, a case of British muddling through versus Teutonic efficiency, uh, despite the fact that this uh, remains the same in Britain and this becomes the norm in Germany. Um, there were similar drivers in both cases, uh, but the diff differences uh, call, were, were caused in the privileging of different design parameters in, in, in each case, uh, and the extent of cha change and the pace of change uh, were affected by those uh, different parameters as well. Um, one of them has to do with the different levels of destruction, which I talked about before, the necessity of building, rebuilding German cities, uh, and plummeting unemployment rates, which combined with, even, uh, with rapid economic growth and higher standards of living, meant that the German waste stream became uh, big, bigger, much faster. An extension of service to more than just the city center that compounded that problem. Uh, and there was therefore a greater willingness and, or perhaps a need for practitioners to consider major changes to existing practice. Interest group organization and, and power in the practitioner community was also important. I didn't spend a lot of time on this, but the difference between the Institute of Waste, Waste Management in Britain, which is a professional organization of individual pr practitioners, versus the Kaban Kamungala Ruhrparks and Stadtreinigung was completed by, which was an association of uh, communal uh, cleansing authorities, required formal representation from all municipal authorities as corporate bodies. These people were there in their official capacity. These people were there as professionals. And there's a very real difference in the extent to which they can then uh, affect policy and practice. Final difference that I think is important is the relative power of manufacturers of bins and the extent of their inclusion in the process of uh, and consultation and decision making on bin design and procurement. In Britain, there were a large number of manufacturers who tended not to focus on um, just on bin construction, but rather there were general sheet metal fabricators, uh, and they uh, made bins among other things. And there were a large number of them that were quite easy to make, uh, and therefore uh, very low barriers to entry, uh, and, and, and the possibility of market power from the point of view of the procurer rather than from the manufacturer. In Germany, there's a much smaller number of specialist manufacturers. They also, this also links to, um, to people who designed the, the vehicles that were used for collection as well. Schmidt and Melbourne was one of them from the 1920s until they went bust in 1961. We can't figure out why, but they did go bust in 1961. Uh, but since then, Sulo uh, and, uh, and Otto have become very large bin producers in international, multinational companies as well, both of them. I'll stop there. There's a, this is actually that. This is Manchester in 1959, um, and that's actually more the way that the British bins tend, tended to look. And as a matter of fact, rather than Glasgow, uh, there's one street in particular that can't, they can't get a collection vehicle down because of the uh, various problems. And we still have bins that look just just like that. I should take a picture of that for the next time. And that's the German one, much more clean, standardized, and, and uh, diverse. I'll stop there. Thanks very much. <laughs>